Good evening, everybody. Um, we're delighted to have Jane with us today. Um, Jane, I'm going to quickly introduce Jane and speak a little bit about her, her curation within MAP Quiet CPB3. Um, and then we can go on to taking questions. I'm taking your, uh, Jane will take your questions and answer. Um, Jane Jun Kaysen is an artist and educator. Uh, who works with video installation, photography, performance, film, and text. Her practice is informed by extensive interdisciplinary work, research and engagement with diverse communities. She was awarded the Exhibition of the Year 2020 by the International Association of Art Critics Denmark for the Exhibition Community of Parting, which we just, um, the video of which we, we just saw now at Kunsthal Charlottenburg and represented Korea at the 58th Venice Biennale. Kaisen has shown her works at venues such as the Kunsthal Charlottenburg, Art Sonier Center, or Arco Art Center, Horse de Culture de Welt, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, Palais de Tokyo, Times Museum Guangzhou, Liam, Samsung Museum of Art, Seoul Museum of Art, Kunsthal Arhus, the Liverpool Biennale and the Jeju Biennale. Kaysen is a professor of media art at the Royal Dan Danish Academy of Fine Arts and received her doctorate in artistic research from the University of Copenhagen. Kaysen was born in Jeju Island, South Korea and currently lives in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, welcome, Jane. I'm trying to see how I can speak to both the audience here and you. So uh, if I'm not looking at you, don't mistake me. I'm sort of addressing the audience here. Um, we just, at least the people here, just got to see your work for the first time. And uh, like I always felt, it's a very moving um, video. It's a very moving film um, that addresses so many different sort of questions, uh, which are relevant not only for you and for Korea, but also for um, for us in India. Um, I'd like to actually start with uh, asking about the title of the work when you speak about communities. And, um, and, you know, it sort of sounds disparate to talk about communities of parting, but there is a sense of sharing and a sense of healing that comes uh, with um, certain sort of practices that remember the abandoned and the dead. So can we speak, would you like to share a little more about how sort of, you know, you, you thought of it as a community and, you know, in what, in what ways, what do they share that makes them a community? Yes, thank you, Buma. And um, it, it's a real pleasure for me also to have the film screened for the first time in India to a live audience. And of course, also to those who are following online. Um, the title Community of Parting actually derives from uh, the work of uh, Kim Hesun, or the poetics of uh, South Korean poet uh, Kim Hesun. Um, so it, it's, it's a direct line taken from her writing. Uh, she's also um, one of the voice narrators of the film both in terms of a poetic voice um, and also as, as a narrator. Um, and I have been very inspired also by her work and especially her writing uh, on the myth of Bari. Um, uh, so, so this was one of the reasons for the title, you know, to somehow also um, honor that inspiration that I, that I take from her and from her work. Uh, I also thought um, Community of Parting somehow was a fitting title for the film uh, because, of the, because of its subject matter. I think there's a kind of um, way in which Community of Parting can both speak to the various different um, experiences that the film embraces, the different uh, migratory and diasporic experiences uh, uh, that are interweaved in the film, but perhaps also with, and, and, and that somehow speaks to notions of, of parting and displacement in a physical sense, 
but also parting in terms of um, the relationship between the living and the dead, uh, because I think this is something that the shamanic um, brings into um, uh, brings into view somehow. You know, so so that's also something probably as as you experienced from the film, this kind of trying to connect different um, disparate times and 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 spaces. Um, so I thought that parting also spoke to that dimension of the film. And in terms of community, yeah, I mean, I think there is something about the film, you know, also that I was trying to, you know, not, not as some kind of fixed community, but to try to trace different forms of affinities across these um, various experiences. Um, you know, so that is perhaps also a community of parting. I think that is the kind of gesture that I was trying to make um, with the film as well. Um. Thank you, Jean. I just have one more question before I, I can sort of pass the mic on to the audience. Um, for us, while curating your work, one of the sort of most powerful sort of statements you make is also the sort of uh, a commentary of, you know, Bari not abiding by these man-made borders. She stands for all those abandoned, all those who don't have a, have a place to call home. And uh, we thought it, it was particularly relevant within our curatorial of what we are looking at as the fear of small numbers, where we are looking at minority communities, whether it be it by their caste, by their class, their gender, or various other sort of parameters that makes them a minority, uh, face an, an incredibly sort of uh, hostile set of um, uh, conditions imposed on them by majority communities. And, and for us, this was a very important thing. And um, a lot of uh, what um, we experience in borderlands around India, uh, be it Kashmir or the Northeast, are actually questions of this kind of belonging, you know, where do you belong? Uh, which part, which side of the border do you belong to? And um, and here you particularly sort of, uh, you bring in transgression as also something that's sort of gendered. You're looking at women and, you know, uh, the transgression is something that's, that, that Bari is, uh, uh, is capable of also because of her gender. Um, can you tell us, speak a little more about that? Like, what, what is, how does the engendering happen here? Yeah, I mean, I think the the whole question of borders um, in many ways was what compelled me to make community of parting. Uh, you see a few, um, and, and I mean, in the geopolitical sense, um, that had to do with the division of Korea um with the division of korea uh, and you see a small part in the film also from uh i mean both from north and south korea but i think what really compelled me to begin to make this work was an experience of joining a women's an, an international women's delegation to north korea where we crossed the border to south korea and this for me elicited a lot of questions around borders. At the same time, what I saw and what I think we're experiencing in many places of the world is um, an increased um, sense of polarity, of territorialization, of, of, of border keeping mechanisms, um, you know, nation states um, drawing their border, like enforcing their borders. In a, in a more and more imposing way. This is something also that um, at the time when I began working on community of parting was happening in Europe, you know, with the whole refugee crisis, you know, and the, the kind of um, fencing of, of uh, borders. And what I began to think about was how can we, or how can I uh, try to think about borders um, in more expansive terms, because uh, it is not only about geopolitical borders, but it's also about a number of uh, psychological and mental borders, uh, you know, that are easily created and enforced. And I think this was what really drew me to the myth of, of Bari, 
because it speaks and you can say that the gendered aspect of the myth um, is that she, I mean, it, it's because she's born a girl uh, that she is abandoned and somehow excluded from the community uh, as the seventh daughter. Uh, so, so, so gender in some ways as gender bias in some ways as a kind of fundamental border keeping um, mechanism, you know, that we see in, in so many societies. Um, and so, um, so, so the gender aspect is, is, is very important, but I think also what's interesting or what drew me to the myth is also, and the ways in which it has been um, important, you know, within shamanic practice um, in Korea as, as a type of, um, a, uh, as, as a myth that speaks to actually the experience also of shamans um, standing at the borders, you know, so she's a liminal figure um, that is at the thresholds, you know, so, so this refusal of choosing one side or the other, um, but, but actually mediating from the side of, of the borders and somehow trying to uh, reconfigure the ways in which we normally think of borders. And then I was trying to think about this um, in filmic terms also in terms of, I think there's other kinds of border drawings that are constantly made, for instance, um, between the past and the present, uh, um, different logics of progress, different stories that are then uh, somehow sidelined or, or not, um, becoming uh, part of a collective memory, um, different spaces that are not um, considered, uh, you know, so also thinking this notion of borders in, in much larger terms um, than solely geopolitical borders or gendered borders, also the borders of, of, of knowledge, for example. Uh, so there's different ways of sort of like diffusing borders that I was curious to explore with community of parting also the border between subject and uh, between self and other essentially, because I think this is something that the shamanic also speaks to, uh, that it is um, uh, somehow diffusing the clear distinction between self and other. Uh, so, so, so these were, you know, and I think there is a, um, at least for me, there was this transgressive uh, potentiality of the myth of Bari in that sense. Also as a, I mean, as a kind of figuration, you know, as, a, as a thinking device, but also as a filmic device to, to try to explore a, a filmic language that in certain ways also um, diffuses certain borders in, in, in terms of its, its, its narrative uh, structure, its, its, its layeredness, its, its um, multivocality. <clears throat> Especially to do with like human and the non-human elements like that, yeah. that that's, that's something that sort of is so relevant today and these borders are slowly, slowly fragmenting and, you know, uh, and this has probably been the strongest border of all, knowledge has been something of a human domain and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, would you, I'd like to actually open up the floor and uh, ask the audience to come up, you know, if you'd like some, if you'd like to ask your questions to Jane. Hello. Okay. Hi, Jane. Uh you can't see me, but my name is Arushi, and thank you for sharing your piece with me, with us. Uh, one of the things that um, was that I remember after having watched and kind of moved me was how the body was used in, in the rituals and how the body is turned into this vessel of to channel. And uh, the, the performance itself was very moving. And at times, I'll be honest, I, I couldn't take it. I had to look away. And um, my question is not so much as a question as a reflection about the process of actually recording those process, uh, because there's a moment where we are part of the ritual, but there's the presence of a camera, which is recording those channeling of the moment. 
So how, how was your experience of recording it and how did the presence of a camera affect the atmosphere? Thank you. Thank, you, for, your, thank you for your question. Um, I think, yeah, it's um, the community of parting was really filmed over a period of five years. Um, and uh, you know, so it was a rather long process of um, of filming all of this material um, in various different locations. Many of the locations also locations that I had already um, been to and somehow established relations before, um, especially with the Xiamen Kusunan uh, and and the uh, Xiamenic ritual. Um, I think in some ways the the whole recording of of that ritual was something that was a culmination of many years of um, having followed the shamans in in Jeju Island. Um, you know, so I think the first time I met uh, Kusunan, the shaman, was. Uh, in, in 2011, you know, the so community of parting is from 2019. Um, and uh, I was very struck at, at, at that time, I was working on, on another film uh, dealing with the Jeju massacre. Uh, I was very struck by her um, oral delivery um, of uh, uh, kind of like the marginalized memories of the, of the Jeju massacre. Um, and so I, I went to many different shamanic rituals in, in Jeju uh, for a number of years prior to actually filming uh, this ritual. And I think, you know, so, so there was something about this. Definitely, I think, you know, she was aware of the camera and, and somehow very used to um, me also coming with a camera. Uh, but I, I think there was a certain... Um, we had a great sort of intimacy between its its other uh, in order to to film this kind of scene. I think um, also with the other people who were involved. I mean, it, it was a very we were a small um, group of people uh, who were present at at the ritual. You know, so not not like a big uh, camera crew, but and I think this is very much. I mean the way in which I record material in, in general, uh, often I will record it myself or with um, my long-term uh, collaborator, you know, so, so, so it's kind of, I, I don't think you can make a camera completely invisible, but it, it's something about um, finding a way in which it's, it's, it's not uh, intrusive, that would at least be the, the aspiration for me. Um, in, in those moments. Um, but there is this quite striking moment maybe that you're referring to in the film where um, it's the only moment actually in the whole film when someone is looking directly in the camera in, in, in this kind of the, the moment after uh, the ritual scene when the Siamen is looking in the camera and I'm looking in the camera. Uh, so, so, so this is a kind of moment where you also become very aware um, of the camera itself. Uh, I think with the body, I mean, this was also something, I think just from, from the various times of, of filming the rituals, um, I, uh, some of it is filmed in slow motion. And I think this was like, kind of like trying to, to um, you know, over time, I, I found a, a way in which I thought this can somehow convey, um, the kind of sensibility that I have when I experience the ritual myself, you know, the, the, to try to find a way to, to film and mediate that also to um, an audience, you know, so, so part of that was also like working with di different um, recording temporalities um, uh, to, to try to achieve that, um, that sensibility. Um, Thank you, Jane. Um, yeah. We have another question from Raksha. Uh, hi, Jane. Thank you for your work. Um, uh, my 
so there was a comment on garbage which i recall and i understood it as a discarding of objects and ways of life could you talk about ways of acknowledging and maybe mourning this disposing of objects and you know what what gets called detritus be it objects or ways of life and conferring dignity when these things don't fit into social and economic structures was that too long oh oh i'm so sorry is it sorry i had a mask <clears throat> so my uh, question you know i um i remember there was a comment on garbage i don't remember the exact quote uh, um could you uh, could you talk about the ways of acknowledging and maybe mourning this disposing of objects and ways of life which what i connected the garbage comment to and you know ways of conferring dignity to the detritus or to what remains especially when it when they don't find a place in existing social and economic structures often impositions thank you mm -hmm. yeah yeah now now i understand the 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 garbage reference is from kim hae sun uh, the south korean poet that i was mentioning um in the beginning uh, from where the title community of party derives and so um she um uh, in her poetry she 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 uses uh, garbage as i mean at least as i understand it as a type of metaphor also because bari um uh, is is not a proper noun it, it it's not a name uh, uh, th this is what Kim Hesun would say that Bari actually uh, derives from uh, the Korean word for basically uh, abandoned. Um, you know, so she makes this connection between abandonment, or, you know, that that which is discarded, that that which is abandoned, and essentially garbage. You know, so it's a kind of play of words, I think, for her. Um, and where she sort of relates that to various different kinds of existences um, or forms of social death, in a sense, uh, this is what another uh, narrator in community of parting is speaking of uh, the notion of, you know, the abandoned as being abandoned as a form of, of social death of being marginalized from the social body. Um, I think something that I found really, I mean, this was really important and revelatory to me about the myth of Bari um, and also how Kim Hesun has talked about it but also how I experienced um, you know that shamans are negotiating their role is that abandonment uh, and also how it's told in community of parting is something that uh, I mean actually community of parting in, in, in the way that I thought of it is uh, configured as a type of journey you know where ab abandonment somehow is being transformed from a, a, from 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 being um, um a, a state of, of being in a state of social death and and marginalization to a kind of contestation of those forces that produce abandonment and in the end it's kind of a um a transformation again of, of of abandonment as something that also opens up for a kind of potential potentiality of, of of seeing reality differently um you know so i think um and, and for the shamans i think because it's also something about uh, undergoing a kind of process of um of actually abandoning oneself to be able to mediate um, on behalf of others. I mean, what, what the shamans do, you know, like this kind of self-abandonment to, to be able to mediate uh, between the living and the dead. Um, so I think there's something, uh, for me at least, I was very curious to explore, you know, um, this, 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 this notion of abandonment, you know, which oftentimes can be understood um, as a type of victimhood, uh, you know, but but actually seeing it in a different light, you know, also as something that uh, that is necessary, perhaps, in order to. Um, 
actually to reconfigure these borders, to actually set the uh, frames differently in terms of um, how one can really relate um, to others. Um, you know, so 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 that is um, uh, th that is one of the aspects that I think the myth of Bari um, um, offers um, as a possibility. Thank you, Jean. Is there some? Yeah, I can. We have another question from Parvati, who's also another artist at the Bedali. Hello. Hello, Jane. Thank you so much for sharing the film. <clears throat> I think I am uh, wanted to know about what it felt like for you to be part of the shamanic ritual. I mean, you very deliberately inserted yourself in the process. And how was that? Did you, did she, did she sort of question you? Did she ask you for a reason that you were doing the shamanic ritual? Did she see it as performative or did she sort of perform the ritual to, I don't know, release you of some of your ghosts, if that's not too personal a question. But I was very curious about, you know, that deliberate choice that you were the person the shamanic ritual was being performed on. So could you tell us a little bit? Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm happy to share that with you. I think, um, there was something in, in, in me sort of really trying to um, go deeper into the myth of Bari and, and, and the notion of Bari. I, th I think there's something about how uh, in the mythological structure, how um, in order to become a Siamin, she somehow has to cross both interior and exterior borders you know, meaning uh, going deep into so, some sort of interior space to confront essentially um, abandonment. Uh, and also to, um, you know, as a prerequisite for actually being able to relate to those in society who are marginalized and abandoned uh, as, as a kind of like a shamanic prerequisite of, of um, uh, of taking on this mediating position. You know, so there's something about along the way in working on this film where I felt uh, I had had all these conversations with others who, um, and, and, and most of the voices of, of people that you hear are people that, uh, they're kind of like close, intimate friends, colleagues that I have known from, for many years who were willing to give their reflections or offer their reflections. Um, uh, uh, or their sentiments on the notion of Bari and of what this myth meant to them. Uh, you know, so at some point it felt like I, I, I had to do that myself as well. I felt with this particular work, um, I needed to do that. Um, so that became, uh, that, be that became a decision at, at a certain point. For this Yamin, I mean, maybe something that's important to say about this particular Siamin um, is that, you know, so we had this long relationship for, um, for many years and it was very important for me that it was her, uh, you know, who would perform the ritual. And this is like from a very sort of, um, uh, um, yeah, quite personal place also. So, so she was the Siamin of my, uh, grandparents' hometown, you know, so they actually knew each other. Um, my grandfather was her teacher, uh, um, and my grandmother was a client of this Yaman shrine, you know. So, so there's something about I think when we started forming a relationship um, ten years ago, um, that was also a point of connection for us, you know, like also around the, the, the history of the Jeju massacre and how that had in, uh, um, affected this particular uh, village in Jeju where the Xiamen is from and, and where my grandparents are from. You know, so for the Xiamen always, and, and for me, uh, I, I didn't see it as a performative gesture, you know, like 
for me, it, it, it had to be a very sort of genuine uh, call actually, or, or request for her um, to perform this ritual. Um, and I, I hadn't, you know, uh, experienced um, myself, you know, like, uh, you know, I had seen all these Yemenic rituals, but this, this was the first time that, that, that one was uh, uh, upon my request, you know, that it involved me somehow. Um, so I don't know if it answers the, the question, um, but, you know, but, but it's a negotiation. I think something that was really interesting in, in this moment for me was also that it was a dialogical negotiation between the shaman and the spirits and, and me. Um, you know, so, so, so this ritual, uh, it, it, it was like a 10 hour ritual, you know, so what you see are, are certain segments of, of the ritual, uh, but, but what happened in the ritual is also that there is a kind of ongoing dialogue back and forth, uh, negotiation back and forth uh, between the living and the dead, so to speak. Uh, so, so, so this for me had to be like that, that was the very uh, sort of like genuine part that I was calling for, uh, you know, just like on a personal level, uh, you know, with, um, yeah, and for different reasons, you know, like certain segments are, are, are taken from that, but there's also certain parts of that that, uh, that I wanted to, to, to keep, uh, you know, for myself, you know, so, so, so you're, as, as viewers, I think you are let in to experience uh, certain parts of, of, of this ritual. Thank you. I thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. That was very beautiful. Thank you. Gee, I have a question, which is this something that we discussed earlier as well, to sort of, um, and particularly to do with the Jeju Island massacre. Uh, what is it that allows you to sort of talk about it today? Uh, it is still a contentious issue, and, you know, it is uh, something that not I mean, it's not a, a space where, you know, mainstream media would sort of easily venture into. How, how what kind of um, climate allows you to talk about it now? Like, what, what is the necessity? How did you sort of, uh, what sort of, Perception also in terms of you know people come to Korea who are watching you know seeing your work. Um, yeah, it does it open up certain questions. It's, are these questions being asked by more people? Yeah, I mean I think it it has also changed quite a bit uh, uh, over the years that that I have been involved in in sort of addressing this memory. You know, so I remember when. Uh, maybe 10, 12 years ago when I, when I, when I started um, sort of also dealing with it in, in my work, it was a different kind of um, climate and it was, um, it was not as easy to talk about. Uh, you know, so, so this also, I think with many histories, you know, like uh, the reception of them have a way of, of changing also with different administrations um, and with different, um, you know, societal sentiments. Um, I, I mean, this is maybe where artistic work actually, I mean, I think for me personally, uh, that, that, that I have this um, belief in artistic ways of addressing these questions um, because it can maybe also talk to, speak to the layeredness of contested histories or complex histories in, in terms of, you know, so very much about like how can, what are alternative audiovisual languages for somehow both, both speaking about um, uh, the event itself, but maybe also how it resonates in society. Um, um, you know, speaking alongside um, certain histories, um, addressing them also 
in poetic ways, but at the same time also speaking about the very real effects that they can have on lives of people. Um, but it is something that I think nowadays, um, I, I think there is a kind of ongoing um, historical renegotiation uh, taking place in, in South Korean society where uh, the, the Jeju massacre is being increasingly um, acknowledged. Um, you know, so, so, and this has a lot to do, I think, with um, uh, many of the, um, you know, local artists, uh, scholars, historians, activists, you know, who consistently for many, many years have um, dealt with this, both on the sort of largest scale, um, you know, truth and reconciliation processes, but also very much on the micro level of local communities, you know, like some, somehow like restoring relations on the village level. And I think this is where the Siamans also play an important role, uh, you know, so not only sort of like historical, uh, um, you know, claims to justice uh, or so on, but but, but also like a, a dimension of sort of like uh, um, reconciliation on the village level of, of, of histories that are very sort of, um, that is very complicated. Um, and I think it's something, I mean, some people talk about, you know, because the Jeju process uh, happened fairly early in South Korea, and this is maybe like a kind of, and, and, and I think people have been very, you know, there, there's of course a lot more still to uh, to do. And I mean, one of the things is also the the role of the United States, which is like kind of like one of these that are a bit less, it, it's, it's less sort of, um, you know, within South Korea, it's sort of, there has been, you know, like an official apology from the state, you know, so that makes it kind of easier to talk about. Um, but there's still a lot of grades of who are considered, um, um, bereaved families and you know th there's a lot of processes that I you know still on ongoing um but yeah in, in an artistic sense I think it, it was definitely a lot more difficult in the beginning now I think a lot of um that's a different kind of space actually for addressing these questions and there's a there's lots of artists also um uh, locally and 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 beyond, you know, who are taking an an interest or investment in 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 this history. Right, and I think it's particularly interesting to sort of imagine, like a Korean pavilion, sort of curating a work like this. You know, at this time in India, we're at a similar sort of uh, you know juncture where we are sort of looking at contested versions of history being uh, made mainstream. And, uh, you know, the sort of uh, a monolithic idea of, of historical events, events and uh, sort of a singular identity that certain forces are sort of vying for. And um, I, it's, it's actually wonderful that something so subversive can also sort of find place. Uh, I don't know if, if it's the nature of the Biennale system as a certain sort of you know, a transnational space that allows for certain dialogues to happen outside the boundaries of, you know, the nation that you're talking about. But uh, it's, I, I found it fascinating that this, this work, which is so sort of, you know, it's so full of uh, uh, ch challenging sort of propositions, which sort of, uh, and how that actually got curated into a national pavilion with it sort of, you know, it's, it's one of those sort of spaces which still have, has like clear, clear delineations between which nation you're representing and, and the, you know, just the irony of it. Yeah, and it was a very special experience also to, to show it there. And I think much um, uh, should be said also about, um, yeah, just the, the visionary sort of curatorial proposition that was made, I mean, not only with this work, but also with the other works in the Korean pavilion that year and, and, and really taking uh, upon itself as, as a curatorial statement to address different uh, histories that um, in many ways have been 
kind of marginalized or, uh, or quieted, uh, not only uh, in terms of history, but also different issues of, the, of, 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 of gender um, and um, addressing, you know, colonial modernity and so on. Um, and, and I think it was also a, something, uh, you know, like a new thing for the Korean pavilion. As, as we see many places also, I, I, I think, with biennials, you know, how, um, uh, you know, and especially with an old biennial like, like Venice, you know, that uh, it has historically um, maybe been other participants, but, but, but I definitely see how that is also being renegotiated at this moment, you know, with different um, uh, also uh, positions, um, indigenous positions or, uh, you know, choosing uh, artists who are not necessarily um, um, fitting neatly within the sort of nation state um, uh, uh, confines, you know, and, 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 I, and I think it's very interesting, you know, because there is um, definitely a possibility to uh, um, Oh, it has a kind of, um, I think, symbolic significance also. Now she can. Try again. Can you speak up? Hi, Jane. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Hi, this is Rati. We meet again virtually from the Inco Center. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this uh, wonderfully nuanced film, and a big congratulations to Buma and Suchi and the team at CPB because I think it fits the title so appropriately maps of disquiet maps with borders and frameworks and sort of plotting and planning in place and your uh, reference to borders all along from the start whether psychological mental political personal geopolitical and the sort of moving between now and before and after the past, present, future, fusing together. What I, I was all, uh, struck with was the fact that although you were reinforcing borders throughout, your narrative was borderless, it was poetic, it was lyrical like the flowing waters. The water was one big thing that I think kept, kept it all together. And I was just telling Parvati here, who also hails from Kerala, the same state that I come from, these shamanistic rituals are still alive. They're still up. People who go there to deal with personal traumas and to sort of relieve the word that you used in your film to relieve it but you're also talking of community. So I, I love the polarities that you brought together in this film. And this is not a question, it's just a comment to say thank you again. I shall come back and look at this one more, get it all in. So thank you, Jane, thank you online. If you'd like to take that before we leave you for the evening. Uh, they're asking, how was the impact of war different across genders? Sorry, what was that? And just thank you for the comment earlier. I, I, I couldn't hear what you were saying. <laughs> Um, the, the question from an online attendee, it says, uh, how was the impact of the war different across genders? Uh, <clears throat> I mean, this is something that I have also explored in a previous film, The Woman, the Orphan and the Tiger. Uh, and I think that in many ways, I mean, this film is from 2010. Um, but that film in many ways, at least to me, is very closely related to Community of Parting that talks about the particular gender dynamics of war uh, and, and the particular ways in which uh, women are affected by war and militarism. 
Um, and I think that is, um, you know, through, um, yeah, just in, in, in various different ways through, um, you know, also the forms of, of, of sexual violence and so on. Um, I think with this, um, I mean, maybe it's something about, sometimes I, I think about, you know, like, rather than somehow, um, or, or that was a work, and I think in some ways also with community of parting, it, it's sort of like looking at, um, the forces or the logics or structures that produce borders or that maintain borders uh, or polarities is 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 often uh, a, a complex structure you know that it's not one thing um and i think you know so so for instance i i, I think it's somehow um you know, for instance, war, militarism, nationalism, patriarchy, somehow we have to think about these, these structures of power uh, in relation, you know, so, so you know, and, and not as, um, like, let's say, uh, just because, let's say Korea reunified, it, it wouldn't sort of uh, remove certain hierarchies within society. And I think this is like something that I, at least I'm thinking about maybe uh, addressing it from, from a gendered perspective is, is, is like th there's other mechanisms of, of power at work and, and somehow being interested in, in addressing these various dimensions because I, I think they're related, they're structurally related. And, and it's something about actually maybe understanding like what is it that um, uh, what what do they consist of and 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 how what what are what are ways in which uh, one can aspire to thinking about social organizations differently, um, you know and 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 of course this is not an easy thing but I think it's something um, and and I think that's something that I liked also about the Germanic that it's always something about being in a process of becoming you know so um and that's maybe also in the community of parting it, it, it's in a process of, of becoming you know of, of trying to build uh, different affinities trying to work towards um a, a different type of orientation that is not oriented towards power you know like we see in many issues right with the decolonization you know that decolonization doesn't necessarily mean uh, an egalitarian society you know it can be easily replaced by different structures of power you know so, but but i think this is something you know not not feminism or gender alone uh, but but by also sort of looking at things from a gendered lens um at least for me it it um it provides this kind of like um i guess like sort of more uh, like a sort of deeper lens to 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 look at these things to look at the dimensions of war for example um because oftentimes what we like at least in, in there's a tendency maybe to think about war also as, as that which happens on the battlefield, you know, but then, you know, what, what does war mean in, in, in terms of the, also of gendered labor and, you know, like also thinking about it in that way. Thank you, Jean. Um, um, thank you so much, Jean. Um, I think with that, we'd sort of um, wrap up the evening. Uh, I'd also like to announce to everyone that Jane's Community of Parting, other than this film, which will be running as part of the screening room. We also have her, uh, the second film um, titled Sweeping the Forest Floor, which will be part of the online screening room as well. It's actually on her web page, which will open on the 15th. Uh, Sweeping the Forest Floor is a film that's uh, shot um, in the border is filmed in South Korea, close to the North Korean border. 
uh, as she st uh, stays inside the civilian control line um, and sort of the additional buffer zone of the Korean demilitarized zone. And um, here the artist follows a number of activists as she, as all of them work together to detect and clear away mines in the area. There are many experts believe that there are up to one to 1.2 million mines that are that still lay buried in, South, in the South Korean side um, by South Korean and US military forces. So this is also a fabulous sort of a shorter video that's available for online viewing. So I urge you all to go check it out. Um, I would also like to announce that um, both Jane and Parvati, who are here with us today, both their projects are, have been made possible by INCO Center, the Indo-Korean Center sort of support. And uh, we're very grateful for INCO's support and sort of collaboration with us uh, for bringing Jane in conversation with us as well as Parvati. Uh, Parvati will again be joining us on a hybrid session just like today uh, on the coming uh, Saturday, 18th December. So uh, please sort of register and uh, join us again next Saturday. Um, thank you so much, Jane. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Um, we're looking forward to sort of for more conversations such as this probably um, later on. And um, thank you again. Thank you for being part of CPB. Bye. -bye. <laughs>